It was September 5th, 1913, 106 years ago, that two young men walking along the Hudson River stumbled upon a package close to the shore. They were curious, but in hindsight they wished they hadn't been. Because inside the package was a torso, a human torso. It had been decomposing in the water, but the head was gone. It was determined that she had been in that package in the river for a few days, and in an attempt to identify the headless trunk found in the river, they noticed a clue. It was a pillowcase. An A had been embroidered into the fabric. It was time to figure things out now. Police began investigating. They looked into who had purchased this pillowcase and finally they landed on Anna Mueller. 21 years old. They had also noticed something else. Anna had been pregnant when she was murdered, dismembered and thrown into the river where her killer had hoped she would remain forever. Surprisingly, the investigative efforts led to a man of God, a Catholic priest named Hans Schmidt. Hans had been born in 1881. He was seven years old when Jack the Ripper tore through the prostitutes of London. But he wasn't born in America. Hans was born in the German city Aschaffenburg. I have no idea if I pronounced that correctly. Hans had one ambition in life. He wanted to become a priest. He would tell anyone with ears that he wished to one day become a servant of God. He did this to such an extent that he required the nickname Little Priest. And a priest is exactly what Hans Schmidt became. In 1906, he was ordained to become a Catholic priest in the German city of Mainz. But Hans was a rotten egg though. He was dishonest and only three years into his priesthood, in 1909, he stood trial for forging educational documents. Hans needed a fresh start so he decided he would move to America. But Hans didn't get along with his fellow parish members in Kentucky, so he was transferred again, this time to New York, where he would finally live his lifelong dream. But of course, he couldn't keep his hands away. Hans Schmidt began having an affair with a woman while being in New York, a young lady named Anna Mueller, when other members of the church found out about this indiscretion, they sought to break them up. But Hans wouldn't let them. He carried on his affair with Anna Mueller until one day she announced to him that she was pregnant. Hans was in a difficult situation. He could either break away from his priesthood and marry Anna. He could deny being the father but considering what the other priests knew, that would probably not work out very well for Father Hans Schmidt. So Hans decided to think outside the box, as they say. He thought to himself that murder would be the best way to get rid of this situation he now had to take care of. Hans purchased a handsaw and a large knife and crept into Anna Mueller's apartment on August 31st, 1913. This man, this servant of God, or whatever he was, snuck up to Anna sleeping in her bed and slashed her throat with his newly purchased knife. After that, after he had committed murder, he dissected her with a handsaw. He figured it would be easier to discard the remains this way. He didn't tear through her flesh for his own gratification. To him it was just what was necessary. It didn't take much prodding by detectives before Hans Schmidt cracked. He began sobbing as he through the jagged breathing of emotional distress admitted to everything. He told them what he had done and why he had done it, but he did say something bizarre when asked why. I mean except for the obvious motive of her being pregnant, he told detectives that sacrifices should be consummated in blood. The following year Hans was found guilty and sentenced to death. A death he would face two years later. He was electrocuted in 1916 in Sing Sing. 
old Sparky got the last taste of the man of God that was Hans Schmidt, the only ever Catholic priest to be executed in America. The case of Dorothy Williams is very interesting to me personally. The reason I find this particular case so riveting is the fact that she is the only black female serial killer I have ever come across. But compared to other serial killers, she had a motive. She was a drug addict and needed money to support her addiction. But that doesn't really fully justify what she did to three elderly people between 1987 and 1989. She was a brutal woman. Before Dorothy Williams committed murder for the first time, she had been robbing elderly people in the neighborhoods. She would knock on their door and ask for a glass of water. After she then had been let in, she would rob them. She committed these home invasions on a regular basis. She had grown up on the streets of Chicago, she was addicted to the heroin, and she had violence within her, something very deep and dark oppressed within her. Eileen Wuornos shot her victims, Dorothea Puente poisoned her victims, Joanna Dennehy stabbed her victims. But Dorothy was different, Dorothy strangled her victims, a very unusual feature in a female serial killer. A lot of male serial killers strangle, usually the ones with sexually sadistic fantasies thus, it's an intimate way of killing another person, and it requires the strangler to be fully committed, to almost be into the idea of it. It was on December 5th, 1987 that Dorothy Williams killed her first victim. His name was Lonnie Laws and he was 79 years old. He had been found in his apartment, a weak old man who wouldn't have put up much of a fight. He was laying on the floor with a belt tied tightly around his neck. His face was purple, he had died clawing for air not being able to remove the belt around his neck. His apartment was in a disarray, and it was clear that robbery had been the motive here, but what I find interesting is why Dorothy would kill Lonnie. She had robbed without killing many times before, so why would she feel the need to tie a belt around this old man's neck? She didn't have to do that, but she did it anyway, and usually, if this would have been the result of a struggle or threats gone too far, it wouldn't have been repeated two more times. It's like Eileen Wuornos claiming all the men she killed was trying to rape her. If it had happened once, I could have believed her, but the repeated pattern doesn't really support her claims. Almost precisely one year after the murder of Lonnie Laws, Dorothy Williams struck again. It was December 6th of 1988 and Dorothy had found another victim. His name was Caesar Swell, 64 years old, and he was badly decomposed when law enforcement found him in his apartment. He had been stabbed three times. This time she hadn't strangled her victim, but this time her victim was 10 years younger. Someone who could have put up more of a struggle against Dorothy, so strangling may not have been successful. But the fate he suffered wasn't too far from strangling. You see, one of the stab wounds had pierced his lung. She didn't finish him off. She left him there, left him to die a slow and painful death. The following summer, July 25th of 1989, Dorothy Williams claimed her third and final victim. This time, she was clearly prepared for what she was about to do. Mary Harris was 97 years old, an easy target for Dorothy who preyed on the old lady's kindness and humanity. She was let inside the apartment and quickly began assaulting the frail old lady, three years shy of a hundred, almost a century old, a century of life snuffed out in a horrible way, an attack that could only be described as overkill. I mean, what could Mary possibly do to Dorothy? She didn't stand a chance, Dorothy was hitting her, kicking her. Then she took out the scarf she had brought with her and from behind began choking Mary Harris. She pulled until Mary was dead 
and then she tied the scarf neatly around the old woman's throat. After that, she began ransacking the house. Police would find Mary Harry's battered body several hours later. Her eyes was black as a result of the beating Dorothy had given her. But Dorothy had been seen this time. A neighbor, 71 years old, had seen her leave the building and he had seen her once again a few days later at a bus stop. Now they had her, Dorothy Williams, killer of three senior citizens. Faced with an overwhelming amount of physical evidence against her, Dorothy did what Eileen Vornos did. She tried to justify her actions. Mary Harry's death had been an accident, although considering the prolonged beating and the scarf tied around her throat, it sure doesn't sound very accidental. I mean, what could she have been trying to do if not murder this old woman? And of course, according to her, the two male victims had been attacking her. You see, apparently it was self-defense. That might have worked with her second victim, the 64-year-old she had stabbed three times. But her first victim had a belt tied around his neck. Gotta be hard to do when you're defending yourself. The more likely explanation that I can think of was that Lonnie Laws, the first victim, may have been a little lippy with Dorothy. He may have refused to cooperate with her, pushing her already low patience. The most telling murder would be her last though. How she so immediately went at the old lady how she beat her before she strangled her, and one might say that Dorothy was afraid of being seen by her victims, that's why she killed them, but she had gotten away with robbing the elderly for a long time before she began killing them. She wasn't worried about it then, so why should she all of a sudden be worried now? And it's also likely that she committed these home invasion robberies without casualties in between her murders, but that's just my speculation, to be honest. Dorothy was in 1991 sentenced to death, lethal injection, but in 2003 the governor commuted her sentence to life without parole. It doesn't really matter what she has to say, her actions shows her true self. Now if you stay tuned, I will reveal who the holiday special will be about. Until next time, I hope you have enjoyed tonight's double feature.